Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we've been talking about the sacrificial law in the Old Testament. Today we're shifting gears to talk about the Levitical feasts, um, but before we do that, I have a very important question to put to the both of you. Um, every so often, you know, I bring up these icebreaker questions slash games, and it is time for one of those again. Yeah. Um, so here is, yeah, you're so enthusiastic. I feel Yay. like. <laughs> <laughs> and there was much rejoicing. rejoicing. Much Yay. rejoicing. So here's the situation. <laughs> There's a movie about you and your life. It doesn't have to be like your real life. <laughs> it could be My the life, life that you imagine. It could be you when you were a kid playing with your friends on the playground or imaginary friends or whatever. It could be the novel that you're writing, but it's about you. What genre of movie is it? That's part one of the question. Part two of the question is what song plays during the closing credits? I feel like it's it's the standard uh pessimist in me to say it's dystopia <laughs> post-apocalyptic <laughs> <laughs> hmm. dystopia like along the lines of eco- equilibrium or something like that uh, yeah seems okay. seems about right so action adventure yeah any i feel like there would be a musical element to your movie <laughs> it's More a sci-fi likely. dystopian musical I want this to be a thing now, honestly. <laughs> I feel like the the best trick I could ever play is Rick rolling the audience right at the end. <laughs> I would appreciate that. I, I appreciate a good Rick roll. Okay, so for Brian, we've got a sci-fi action adventure dystopia. That's okay. a musical. I, I am being <laughs> I am being sarca- sardonic and pessimistic when I say dystopia. It's probably not that. <laughs> okay. And never going to give you up by Rick Astley. Yes, that one's, okay. I'm dead serious on that one. Okay. We'll take it. <laughs> All right, Greg, do you have a genre? It would have to be something along the lines of, what do you call it? Friendship movie? Like uh, a buddy? A buddy film, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Set in a small town, but with elements of fantasy or and or sci-fi with a mystery. <laughs> yes. I think these are all my genres lumped together here. Um, <laughs> and unlike Brian's, mine would have a happy ending because <laughs> uh, I was raised that way. I grew up in a. I grew up in the. You know. Well, I grew up in the I'm 60s. Not, but the 50s. I never said anything about my <laughs> I just said 50s. something about the song. <laughs> the 50s never quite ended for me. I kind of skipped the 60s. Um, <laughs> so the, I, I do not have a song. I can tell you the nature of the song. Sure. It's probably a yeah. song that someone out there could could name. But it would be, it might be uh, the closing things from some old TV sitcom or some old movie. It would be something with nostalgic connections uh, appropriate for a coming of age of it all mm-hmm. ends all of this has ended happily but the future is ahead of us and i don't think the closing theme to star trek would do it um <laughs> it's something a little more old-fashioned i almost want to say andy griffith's closing theme <laughs> but uh, i yeah i don't know that's it yeah there you go. Okay. That's all I got. Well, if you think of the specific song and you want to tell us next week, you want to think about it for a week, yeah, you can no, do that. Yeah, no, I really don't. It's not, <laughs> it's not coming that fast. Right. Emily, but we have not heard yours. Oh, I think mine has to be some sort of historical drama, but there's the potential for it to also be a musical, and I'm pretty sure <laughs> there's a motorcycle chase in it. Um, <laughs> so when you say historical drama... <laughs> I mean, we're talking Great Escape. I guess that has a motorcycle chase and it's historical. I mean, that is my favorite movie. Oh, all right. I mean, I think I think we determined recently that it's tied with Sound of Music, and then we realized that The Great Escape and The Sound of Music are the same movie. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. but I think the closing theme 
That's true. I should have given you more heads up because I actually thought about this for days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the closing theme would the be... Cl the closing theme is O oh, Valencia by the Decemberists. I have no idea cool. what it's, it's very upbeat, but okay. I think the lyrics are actually like Romeo and Juliet, West Side Story kind of thing. But it's very cheery and uh -huh. I like it. And it's the right mood for the closing of the movie about my life. So, okay then. Yeah. What's the song that has two cats in the yard? Life used to be so hard. Oh yeah, uh, our house. Our house. Yeah, that's a very very. Crosby, house. Stills, and Nash. I want to say that that might work. Um, okay. One or two of my girls have used that for important things before. That's a great song. I really like that one. All right, so we're talking about the Levitical feasts. There are six of them, but. Uh, well, seven if you count the seven. Seven. Sure, but then we get the new moons and the year of jubilee and like, the sabbath years and yeah yeah lots of other things but the nature of the calendar in this christian worldview is a little bit different from the nature of a calendar you might have found in other pagan religions in other contexts we've talked about how the magical worldview sees ritual as affecting something in the world it's it's ontologically serving to shape reality according to man's wishes mm -hmm. and according to his words how is the hebrew calendar different if it's not ontological would you say it's ethical what what function is happening here well i suppose the overriding biblical category would simply be covenantal mm -hmm. ethicals okay except it's kind of an aristotelian category and <laughs> sure. anything that gets me anywhere near aristotle always makes me nervous i start breaking out into hives and things <laughs> like that but if we understand it properly i suppose it's it's a matter of covenant obedience god in the old covenant laid out a particular pattern for his worship all of these days were not simply holidays as we conceive of such things but they were holy days the original origin of our holiday and so they were times to worship. They were times where God called his people either locally in their local assemblies, which were not yet called synagogue, but functionally were that, or at the tabernacle or later the temple to come into his presence with, with the rest of his people and do specific things. We've talked about the, sacrifice, the sacrificial laws and the various sacrifices and uh, what they did, the calendar that God mandates spells out what sacrifice for what event. And it's not my intention, largely because I don't have it memorized, to uh, walk through exactly every sacrifice that, that transpired on, on each occasion. Passover is easy, the blood of the Passover lamb, which was the original peace offering. On the uh, Day of Atonement, you have the, the sin offering, along with its companion, the scapegoat. And first fruits, there's the offering of, of grain and cereal, but there were other blood sacrifices that were with that. The waving of the first fruit sheath is simply a grain offering resting on the Passover that just transpired. The point is, and here's here's a an area for Christians to start meditating on thinking about the Ludwig order for so long. Uh, this is something our children should know so that by the time we get to our age, we should say, well, of course, obviously, you know, it's not obvious really. Uh, we haven't spent that much time on it, but it's, it's if we can just you know plant some seeds here and get people thinking. Like, These are things. I think that was in the Old Testament. Yes, and whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. They're written for us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. That we through um, scriptures might have confidence and hope. Paul tells us something along those lines. So there, 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 there's a couple angles you could approach this from. This is God's call to His people to worship. We worship God when he calls us, and traditionally Christian worship begins with a call to worship, usually taken directly from Scripture. Something like, come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, or any of a number of things. The Book of Common Prayer has its share, and other traditions have theirs of pieces of Scripture we use to, to tell God's people, this God summons you to worship. You have his permission, you have his blessing. He's saying, come on in. And then we find ourselves in the presence of God. And then the liturgy kicks off from there. What do you do when you're in the presence of God? First of all, you're awed at his holiness and confounded by your sin. And so that needs to be addressed up front. 
And then as you understand that you have peace with God through Christ, or in the Old Covenant, through the blood of the sacrifice that points to Christ, then you are joyful and you want to sing and you want to talk to God and you want to hear from God. And somewhere in there, in many cases, there's a, a fellowship meal, at least if it's a, a, a peace offering that's involved or some other celebration. Most of these fe most of these festivals were feasts. So God is again involving the whole man, not just the spirit. <laughs> Ding! <laughs> it's very non-Gnostic. He calendar. feeds the body as well as the soul. He feeds the body as well as the soul. Feeds our need for communion with one another. Mm. Chevy Chase did a whole series of uh, National Lampoons, summer vacation, Christmas vacation, all that. I don't think I ever saw any of them all the way through, but I think the point of them was American va family vacations have a history of going really bad and being <laughs> annoying and frustrating, and yet we keep doing them. There's something about we're all in this together. It's just us against the world. We're going to go see something new that builds community, builds memories, builds experiences together, uh, changes our perception of the world. And as Israel came together three times, Three times, three of the feasts were mandated attendance in Jerusalem. And not the whole family didn't have to come, but very often they did, at least to one. Uh, we see this, for instance, with Samuel's parents and then with uh, Jesus' parents. Uh, this kind of thing would happen. That kind of blows my mind that every family, like, it must have been a lot of people, right? It would be <laughs> a lot a of people crowd. on the road, you know, and you would expect as you go by this village or that village, hey, your friend Teddy from last year. He's going to be there. <laughs> oh, Teddy, hey, come on, join. You know, and, and you would tr generally, the, the men traditionally traveled with men, women, with women, the children, with either side, depending how old they were. But it was it was a community building thing. It wasn't a forced march. It wasn't military. It was celebratory. Um, and kids would look forward to seeing the, the, the friends they met the year before or the year before that. Sort of like going to a Christian summer camp, you know, <laughs> for your denomination. You don't see them any other time, but you see them then, and you're Christians together. But that also comes with all the practical hardships. Walking a long way, most people did not have mules or donkeys, let alone horses. They might have an ox cart, but ox carts are not terribly comfortable. Um, so as with things in our church, uh, our churches today, you know, we believe, at least those of us here, that God ordained the baptism of babies. You know how bad that can go? <laughs> God knew that. The crying, the wetting the diapers, you know, everything that could go wrong, will go wrong, eventually, baby throws up. God knew that. <laughs> and yet he said, do this. He, he does, he's not, he doesn't have such an, uh, an air of, of, of sanctity of tradition that he's not willing to laugh with the little kids and, and their foibles and us with ours. Uh, it was, well, it's also a really great just illustration of how God's there for every moment, every mm -hmm. kind of moment. Mm -hmm. It's not just this, you know, God isn't just the guy you go worship on Sunday and you get dressed up in your best clothes and he's only there really when you're there looking nice for him. And, you know, he's like, he'll only help you out when you're there to look nice for him. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, he, he's there for every moment, including when you're in sweatpants eating a pint of ice cream and crying over something horrible that's happened to you. Yeah. Or if you're even so young that you can't put into words what is hurting you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a lot of what this is. There's a <sighs> contrast this with the American calendar. You know, when we, as a nation, as we became a nation and so broke away from from Britain, we pretty well scrapped the church calendar because it was perceived as denominational, sectarian. You were um, Anglican or Lutheran if you observed all that, and it still smacked a bit of Rome to a lot of people. And so very quickly, we began to replace the traditional church holidays with patriotic days, uh, Washington's birthday, later Lincoln's. Fourth of July to celebrate the Declaration. Thanksgiving came and went until finally it came and stayed. But the reference was more to the origins of the country than to Thanksgiving to God. And, you know, you could throw on that Christmas remained, although it's become increasingly secular. And Easter, too, was secularized. And these things, 
uh, let's not forget All Saints Day <laughs> or Reformation Day, however you want to perceive it. Either way, it's a church holiday, but you know, we turned it into something that's fun for kids, which in and of itself is not a bad thing. I've watched children come to Reformation Day services over the years, and it's pretty much horrible for them. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's boring. Lectures on the fine points of theology and Reformation history. There may be a good way to do that, to, to include kids joyfully, but I haven't completely seen it yet. But all of these things provide a wide range of experience from fireworks to going out at dark in costume to adorning your house with bright, pretty lights and putting packages under the tree to buying heart-shaped cards for particular loved ones, you know, uh, having turkey and stuffing and watching ball games. All of these have helped shape the American psyche that we, we anticipate these things. Our economy anticipates these <laughs> things. You know, they, 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 they move us along. And although it's not self-consciously a religion, there are religious aspects about it. But most certainly, whether it was all intended or not at any point, there is a discipline of life that set celebratory days um, set for us. They make us think about things. Halloween and Christmas, you think about children. Even Easter, you think a little bit about children. Some churches don't. Some churches are... You know, don't want to go there because that's adding to scripture or introducing pagan elements. But let's face it, most Americans hide Easter eggs and raise mm -hmm. Christmas trees and send their children out in the dark, maybe with a responsible adult to go <laughs> say trick or treat. Um, I, I lived through all of that and didn't, and it itself didn't seem to hurt me any. But it, it makes you, gives you something to look forward and something to look back on and something to remember. Well, if we can come up with something like that, I think we can conclude that God had much better and bigger ideas and that they actually worked a lot better than anything we have. And so as we look at the, uh, the festivals, we should see that God is instructing his people. He's communicating truth about the coming Messiah and his kingdom and the age to come. And he's uh, teaching, he was teaching Israel some habits of thought and life that would be productive in that direction. And then when Christ comes, yes, all these things were shadows, but those shadows collapse and coalesce in Christ, who is the body, and they pass over the New Testament's Lord's Day. So we can look at these festivals and say, well, we don't do that anymore, or we don't have to do that. But there's something here that, that speaks today, even to our Lord's Day celebrations, to go into church on Sunday. So with that in mind, we can, I think, at least recap what, what they are. We've, we've talked extensively about the Sabbath. And I don't really want to go there anymore. You know, it's always the temptation of what what can you do as a Bible <laughs> teacher of teenagers? That's one of the foremost questions. Is it all right if on Sunday you go ask your parents? I'm not getting out of the <laughs> trap. Uh, I, I I think there is a danger when Sunday becomes the most boring day of the week for children. We've done something mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, and that's, I leave for people to sort out in terms of their own tradition. But uh, that's in, uh, in Leviticus, that's the first one, Leviticus 23, I believe. Um, that's the first one that's mentioned, and it's called a feast. The Sabbath is a feast. You're supposed to eat. You're supposed to eat good food. You're supposed to enjoy the good food that you're eating. Um, it's... One thing, you know, we, we've dealt before with the um, regulative principle of worship. And I, and I think sometimes it overlooks rather obvious things like you, you want a clear command for something. It's a feast <laughs> to the Jewish mind. That implies two things, good food and wine. So, and the same thing holds for these others. Passover, when, when Jesus came. There were cups of wine that were part of the Passover celebration. God never authorized it. He never specified it. And yet Jesus, Jesus, when he was offered these cups, or they were ready for him to present, he didn't dash it to the floor and say, how dare you defile my father's worship? He picked it up and turned the third cup into a cup of blessing. He instituted the Lord's Supper with it. He took what was a logical, I won't say addition, but extrapolation from what God had said. And, and used it to ignite the new covenant sacrament because it's a festival, it's a feast. You drink wine. It was that simple. 
and there was there's no condemnation from Christ that you read too much into it. So yes, the scripture regulates our worship most certainly, but sometimes we need to look a little more closely at what God actually has said. <laughs> there's something I love to notice in the traditional Passover liturgy, as well as in all of these cases where all of Israel is gathering and looking at memorials and things, that the children are involved in this process. They have a question to ask. Of, mm -hmm. Why do we do these things? And the assumption is they're there, they're involved, and they're, they're not left out because they're too young to understand. They're supposed to be there, and you're supposed to be parenting them all the way yeah. and, and showing them where God brought you. Like, look at that stone. Do you know why we do that? No, Dad, why do we do that? Because God brought us out of Egypt, you know? Yeah, yeah I've, uh, my, my father in his younger years was, if he was a Christian, he was a very weak one and did not take any kind of lead along these lines. I believe he, he came to Christ in his later years. Um, for, I believe that for a number of reasons. And because it's a good thing to believe of one's dad, but our, our family suffered a great deal from, from secularization because of that. Mm -hmm. Christmas, you got up, you got the presents, you tore into them. Make sure mom and dad get theirs too, because you're nice. You know, that kind of thing. And I still see remnants of that when I'm around younger children at Christmas time. They can't, they, they want to skip by the explanation of this is why we're here. This is why we're doing this too. What do I get? What do I get? Well, there's a time for teaching, but it's going to take some, I think if you wait till the last second and, and do the teaching, it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was, uh, as a child, I was always a strict traditionalist. You open Christmas presents Christmas morning. <laughs> you don't do it before then. That's like some kind of cosmic sacrilege to open them early. <laughs> um, until I got older and did stop caring about presents and wanted to sleep in. And <laughs> Dad said, uh, no, we have to get up at six o'clock and open presents. He said, let's open them the night before. I don't longer care about this. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I, I, I think that you need to do a lot of explaining ahead of time. And yes, mm -hmm. the uh, for instance, the Passover has the standard question. It, it's presented in the law as, well, your children will say this. And Israel generally said, okay, where's the cue card? Hand it to the oldest kid. <laughs> yeah. Okay, read this question so we can answer it. But presumably, there would be a lot of conversation in the days before, especially if the kids and, and mom are going with them. About why are we going? What is this all about? What, what Kids is... love that question, right? Yeah. Why? Uh, why? Yeah, why? 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 <laughs> and so this is a great chance to explain things. We can take advantage of this in, in things like, and this is an area where I, now that I now that I'm coming up with this bright question, I look at how badly I failed in this respect. But you know, why why does the pastor raise his hands toward us when he says these words? What are those words? What do you think he's doing there? Why do we stand here and sit here? Um, why do we use this kind of music and not the kind that you see in Disney movies? You know, there's all kinds of things that you can ask and maybe they'll start asking their own, but these are wonderful teaching times. If we have eyes to see, my wife has always been great about this, about, um, seeing and gently creating without ever forcing the issue moralistically to, to give an opportunity for children to talk about such things. Speaking of Disney films, one of my best conversations with my oldest daughter, she was about two at the time. Everybody else must have been sick that day because we were on our way to church alone. And for some reason, she said, Daddy, why does everyone try to kill princesses? Yeah. Mm, Whoa. That's a good question. <laughs> it is. I never spent, would have thought to ask that question. And we spent the rest of the time talking about um, the church as the bride, Satan wanting to kill the bride. Uh, she as a as a daughter of God and thus a princess in God's family. It was wonderful. I wish I could remember it all, but I know if I, my memory says it was a wonderful conversation. So it must have been. So one thing that we have here in all of this is God presents different kinds of circumstances to provoke different sorts of opportunities. What if every holiday on the American calendar we celebrated exactly alike? Let's say that every holiday was a mini Christmas. You go out, you get a tree, you put lights on it, you put presents. There's the mistletoe and the eggnog, and every single, every single holiday is like that. It's a, it's a bit samey. Yeah, <laughs> samey. Yeah, it's a bit samey. And God doesn't do that. The the 
there were some similarities. They're all worship services, and three of them required you to go to the tabernacle or temple. Others didn't. The Day of Atonement didn't require you to go anywhere. In fact, it told you to stay home and think about your sins. Um, but with each, I mean, the, the difference between, uh, think again for children, between trumpets. Here, Bobby, here's a trumpet. Go blow it. <laughs> Hank, what did you just do? Do you know what you just released up? On the world. And um, tabernacles were, hey, Dad, this is the greatest Ford ever. Come on <laughs> yes. in. I'll see if I can fit. Uh, each of these is, there's something fresh about it. So it's not just, as, as adults, often what we look for is very simply a day off. And, and depending on the season, we know more or less what we do with our days. Often, often it's the same thing. Sleep in. Um, maybe some for some of us, it's gardening here, going to the snow here or, or something else. Uh, but God was was more thoughtful in what he did. So we got as far as the the yearly festivals. The first one, well, here's something we have to talk about first, though. And that's the whole concept of the year. When God created heaven and earth, it apparently was someplace... In, in, near, or around the autumnal equinox. And that day um, becomes New Year's Day. Uh, and this, and so the seventh month would begin uh, around the, um, the vernal equinox. So it would span those. When God brought his people out of Egypt, he shifted the calendar mm -hmm. by six months so that the, what had been the seventh month beginning with the vernal equinox, now was the first month. And what had been the seventh month, beginning with New Year's Day, was now the seventh month. I, don't know, I hope I just said that right. What had been the seventh <laughs> the month The first is, month became the seventh month. Yeah, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first becomes the seventh, seventh becomes the first. The first shall be last. And the last. Yeah, the first shall be last. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> uh, because, but Israel continued to use both calendars. The liturgical or ecclesiastical calendar is the one that we pay attention to when we're looking at the feasts and such, but for uh, anointing kings and tracking their reign and such, more often the, the civil calendar is used. So You've got although, the fiscal year yeah, starting yeah. at Rosh Hashanah. Right, exactly. So you just as we have fiscal years and school years and calendar years, they, they also ran to two years side by side, and, and it didn't bother them. They were smart people, and they could figure out what was going on. So with this new calendar, uh, the first month is was called the Bib. Later on in Persian days, it was called Nisan. And on the 10th day of that, they chose the Passover lamb, checked it out for three three days or so to make sure it was free from, from blemish. And then on the 14th day at even, they killed it and it's a, it's a sacrifice, it's a peace offering, which they ate together with their families and possibly neighbors if they had a small family. Uh, this was coincident with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And, and here again, the Jewish fathers turned this into kind of a game for the kids. They'd, they, they would deliberately leave packages of leaven scattered throughout the house. And at night they would go with a candle <laughs> through the house and find all the packages of leaven, a treasure hunt. But it was something that would stick this in the minds of their children, of this the leaven of Egypt, we have to leave behind. We must get it out of our house. Very practical kind of Sunday school thing, but it worked and God blessed it. Uh, and, but we've talked about Passover. What happened, there was Passover and then a Sabbath day. Or Passover was the Sabbath day. The 15th was the, was the Sabbath day. And the day after, something happened that's only mentioned once or twice in the whole Bible, which is in itself odd. But... It's Passover is dated from the time of barley harvest. So they will, I think we talk about this next week, but in addition to all the other complications, Israel was also running a solar year and a, and a lunar year. <laughs> and the lunar year has more like 13 months or 12 point something. And every couple of years you have to add one, you have to add a month then. Um, and so because of the shifting, they had to keep the the lunar calendar tied to what actually was happening, like really harvesting barley. And so they once the they knew that the barley crops were coming up, then they would watch the horizon very closely for, I guess it would be the new moon? Full moon? I don't even know. Whatever the moon does at that point, at the beginning of the beginning of the month. And when they saw that, then they would blow the trumpets and it would, they would echo throughout the land. And every month was announced by the blowing of a trumpet for a total of seven throughout 
the agricultural and liturgical year. Well, it would be hard to see the new moon. Yeah. So, so if you're going to be looking for <laughs> so that, you're going to be looking then. a while. <laughs> yeah, that's not it then. Um, so, so that's going on. Well, so it's tied to the barley harvest, mm -hmm. and you can, you can't you it has to you have to wait for the barley harvest, and you have to wait for the moon to be in the right cycle. And when it is, then you can have Passover, and that means that the barley, the first of the barley, is ripe, and on the day after the Passover Sabbath. Somebody someplace, in the, again, the details are exceedingly lacking, whether everybody did this locally or representatively, or somebody just went out into the fields near the tabernacle and cut something, or people nearby ran to the tabernacle and had a contest of who gets there first. We, we, we don't know. We're not told. But they bring the very first sheaf that's harvested, and they, they take it and they wave it before God. It's bloodless. Now, this is interesting because all the other sacrifices, even first fruits, require blood offerings. This one, by implication, has its roots in Passover the day before yesterday. And it's waving a sheaf, the first fruits of the whole crop that's following before God in the presence of God. Now, that's all we got here in, in Leviticus um, 23. It takes St. Paul to fill this in and say, Christ, the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ is coming. Christ is the first fruit sheaf. And he dies on Passover, spends the Sabbath day in the grave, and then he comes forth uh, on that first Sunday. And that's why it's not bloodless. The blood was shed by the Passover lamb. Now the Passover lamb got better and he's alive. And he's being waved in the presence of God to signify that I'm the first. I got a whole bunch following me. And on the calendar, we point then to the next feast, which is actually called First Fruits or Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks, because it's seven weeks plus a day or 50 days, thus the Penta, when people have got together their own harvest of their own of their own fields. And they've, they've completed the first round of harvest. And so the work's done. God's given them 50 days to get that first harvest in. And they bring it and present the first of the first crops, barley and whatever comes due at that time. And they present it before God. And we have a picture here. Now, it's 50 days after Passover. This is one of those other things where God expects us to flex our mental muscles and say, did anything significant happen 50 days after Passover? And again, it's not obvious. There's no place that says, and lo, it was the 50th day. <laughs> what it says is more like, okay, we're now in the second month, and then this happens, and this happens, and then it gets down to we're really close to 50 days, and then Moses starts going up and down mountains, <laughs> which I completely missed as a, as a young person, even even as an old, even as a Bible teacher. I looked at it, and I, in my mind, I saw Moses going, bop, 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 bop. <laughs> boy, he went up and down that mountain a lot. Now, this is dumb, because I've climbed Mount Lassen. <laughs> you don't go in two or three times in a day. Each tip to the top of a mountain takes a day and you're worn out. So rather than say, oh, each of these is a whole day and that's going to get us really near 50, I just completely missed the point. So if we do the proper calculations, we find out that Pentecost also pointed back to the giving of the law. What's it point forward to? Well, we, we know the New Testament, right? <laughs> we all know about what happened on the day of Pentecost. Holy Spirit's poured out. The law is written in people's hearts. And we see the, the harvest of Israel, the first fruits. And in a couple places, um, the early church has spoken of the first fruits unto God out of his creation, particularly in the book of Revelation, the expression used. So that's the beginning of the harvest. God began first the Jew, afterward the Greek. And so now we're looking down the eschatological pipeline to tabernacles. But first... We go through the months. Each month begins with a new moon. Each one is announced by trumpet till we come to Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the seventh month. And Rosh Hashanah is New Year's Day. We talked about this. First of Tishri. It remembers the day the world was born. But in doing so, it celebrates the coming of God. When God comes, he comes with trumpets. Think of Sinai. Mm -hmm. Trumpets. And, and if... if God had wanted to, he could have ordained that Israel had, you know, gunpowder and fireworks and all that. He, he chose 21 to 21 gun salute. <clears throat> yeah, he chose to skip that. He, he thought trumpets would do it. But, you know, that's the kind of thing we, we would do. We would have all kinds of special effects and perhaps thereby diminish the majesty of God. 
but they were to think of God coming. God comes, God came in creation. He comes in history to judge his people. He came at Passover. He will come in the person of Messiah. And one day he will come to judge the world. And each of these comings is a day of the Lord, leading up to the great and terrible day of the Lord. Terrible in the sense that it is awe-inspiring. It is not a light and trivial thing. And even the holiest of God's saints must look with wide open mouth, wide eyes, and awe at the glory of God that's going to be revealed then. And so with that as an introduction to the seventh month, people should begin to think about judgment. Uh, and, and hear a word about judgment. We hear the word judgment, we think judgment's bad. It means <laughs> you're judging me. You're saying nasty things about me. You are punishing me. Synonymous with condemnation. Yeah. And that's not at all what the Bible means by that. A judge, judges. Presumably, there's someone who's been harmed and there's someone who's done the harming. He justifies the one and condemns the other. For a man to have his day, we used to use the expression, I want to have my day in court, not hoping you will be punished, hoping you will be vindicated. Uh, and the word is used this, some, used this way, particularly I'm thinking of uh, the book of Revelation. It's time for you to judge the dead. And there the context is not the final judgment. It's talking about the saints who have been martyred uh, by the Jews and by Rome. It's time for you to, to judge Israel and to judge Rome, to vindicate your saints by bringing destruction upon these, these pagan powers. So when we come to God's presence, we you step into the presence of a holy God. Judgment's inevitable. God looks at you. He sees you. He sees you down to the core of your being. And, and God does not put his, his mind and ethical faculties on hold or wear, well, doesn't wear rosy glasses. What he does wear, of course, is the blood of Christ in front of his eyes, which we're going to see in the next feast. But... For the Christian, then, to stand before God in Christ's merits is a sobering thing, but a joyful thing. To stand, to come in God's presence in one's self-righteousness is a very dangerous thing. And we can think of Paul in Corinthians when he speaks of, uh, you need to judge yourself because you haven't been, some are weak and sickly and some sleep. <laughs> Coming into God's presence for worship lightly, particularly to this Holy Sacrament, can be damning. And it can be death. The next... Um, after trumpets, the next feast is the Day of Atonement. Uh, it's on the 10th. And I I'm going to throw this out so that somebody somewhere notices it and remembers, and I have this for permanent record. You notice the Passover lamb is, is chosen on the 10th of Renaissance, mm -hmm. and that the Day of Atonement is on the uh, 10th of Tishri. I don't know why. I have a partial guess that I'm not going to share. But there, I don't see anything in Scripture that singles out why in the world the 10th should be important. Ten, seven plus three? Eh. But I just thought I'd throw that out there because I haven't seen anybody mention it anywhere. Maybe well, we've some... got 10 plagues, 10 commandments, judges judged over groups of 10. Yeah. So there's some sort of judgment going on here, There's right? something <laughs> like... there. There's something there. Maybe, yeah, maybe that. Maybe there's a connection with judgment. Anyway, scapegoats. But first, we have to back up and think about sin offerings. The sin offering had reference to the tabernacle. The tabernacle was God's house, but God's people are God's house. And so the one reflects the other. When God's people sin, it's as if that's reflected in the tabernacle, as if it's to God visible as um, mold in the walls. And nobody wants to live in a moldy house. God doesn't. So the sin offerings that applied blood to various parts of the tabernacle were the daily, weekly cleaning of the house, not from real dirt, but from sin and its influences. So God would continue to be content to dwell with his people on a day-by-day -day basis. But this is the, the big spring cleaning of the year when God, in a big way, guarantees his people, I am staying with you. And a number of things happen, but the, the ones we'll focus on are first the offering of a, a sin offering, a goat, whose blood the high priest would take within the veil. This is the only time during the whole year he'd go behind the second veil into the Holy of Holies. He would go both with incense uh, and also with the blood of the lamb, or blood of the goat, and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Now, the Shekinah glory, God's presence, manifested itself above the cherubim, then the mercy seat as a lid on the ark, and then within the ark, 
from the tables of stone, the Ten Commandments. God looks down upon his law and sees its provisions and stipulations and knows that his people have broken it. But once a year, the high priest, the mediator, the Messiah, is to put blood there so that God will look at his broken law through the blood of the sin offering and be content, be satisfied, be propitiated, the word we don't use anymore. It means his wrath has turned away and he will be content to dwell with his people for another year. Now, it's not magic. If you do it on belief, God's going to call your bluff. And you can think, we can think here of the, uh, of Hophni and Phinehas uh, hmm. and their abominable worship, what they did to corrupt the worship of God and how God eventually got up and left and turned his sanctuary over to the, to the Philistines. And the same thing Isn't, later. Yes. In a lesser, to a less condemning extent, uh, Zacharias when he got the message from the angel of the Lord and he he wasn't quite looking in faith. And the angel <laughs> says, yeah, no, you, you just need to shut up for a few months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to come into God's presence uh, without faith, it's um, a questionable business. And the thing that we usually, fo well, we focus on that to a certain extent because of the getting to go the, into the Holy of Holies. But the other thing that usually grabs our attention is the other goat. There are two goats to begin mm -hmm. with. And the priest confesses the sins of Israel on the heads of both. One is sacrificed. The other, though, is given to a man. He's taken out in the wilderness and let go. He escapes, as it were, into the wilderness. He escapes judgment and death, bearing the sins of God's people. And this seems to be a, an image or a figure that God takes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. Mm -hmm. He takes them out of memory, out of sight. One of the minor prophets speaks of God. Throwing, them, throwing our sins behind his back into the depths of the sea. It's that kind of thing. And again, another visual preaching of the gospel, another way to think about what God does for us so that we don't go on being haunted. But I'm a, I'm a wicked, miserable sinner. Yeah, sure are. But you know what? You got a great God. And he just dealt with that. Rejoice now. However, the Day of Atonement was not a day where Israel had to come to the temple. It was the one day where they were to stay home. And it's the only fast day on the calendar. They're to afflict their souls or to think seriously about their sins and their need for forgiveness. And when that day's over, back to normal life and back to normal living. You don't, God doesn't have us crawling around in, in guilt and self-pity and fear throughout the year. One day of look God in the face and say, yes, Lord, I trust you because I got nothing. And then you're back to the life of service and dominion and fellowship with God. And then that leaves us with... Tabernacles, or, yeah, tabernacles, which also has multiple names. Tabernacles, booths, in gathering, in gathering, because it was the final feast where the grapes and wine and um, wheat were brought in. There was a series of sacrifices. Lasted a week long. There was a series of sacrifices. Most of the sacrifices were identical day by day, but one thing changed. There were bulls offered, and the pattern of the offering, the numbering of them, is odd. It's like 13, 12, 11, 10, you know, mm, down. To, yeah. And as you, you look at that, and think, what? Why? There's no explanation. But when we, if we add them all up, we get 71 or 70 plus one. And by this point, we're supposed to, God has used the number 70 on us a number of times. And the first time was when the table of nations uh, in Genesis 11, where he presents the nation summed up under 70 names. So this is Israel acting as a priest for the nations, 70 sacrifices plus one for Israel. And meanwhile, they're building their little booths or tabernacles from tree branches they find wherever they can. And remembering when they dwelt beneath the glory cloud and little tabernacles of their own, they tabernacled in the shadow of God's greater tabernacling in their midst. And they celebrate the future in gathering of the Gentiles, which begins with the gospel proclamation to the Gentiles with St. Paul and reaches to the end of the world, to the end of time, to the final resurrection. And we have hymns that tie this together, that tie the figure of gathering in God's harvest with the final re resurrection and judgment. And I'm not going to even try to sing anything. But um, this this is a, and, and, and something I, I completely missed until like, you know, 20 minutes ago when I said it, is that the liturgical year and the agricultural year were the same. Mm. It begins, or at least as far as harvest is concerned. The harvest season and the liturgical year are the same. We begin with the harvest of barley, we end with the harvest of wheat and grapes. And when you begin to look at all of Christ's parables and Paul's analogies, 
we begin to see a great deal of that piling on top of it. It's not just because Israel was agricultural, although that helps, but it's because God had deliberately woven in truths about seeds and growth and harvesting into the Old Testament economy, into their calendar. So Israel thought through this and, and one would hope meditated upon it. They, their perception would be changed as to what their function was. We're, we're, worship, we're, we're worshiping God and praying for the Gentile nations. There's going to be a harvest. God's going to harvest. There's going to be a first harvest. There's going to be a later harvest. And it all begins with the death of the Passover lamb. Huh. I wonder yeah. what that means. You know, it's <laughs> obvious to us. I mean, this was implicit be. in what we said before about the, the barley harvest, but let's yeah. go back and make it explicit. Unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die. Yeah. This is this is an, a resurrection telling. This is... Absolutely. Yeah. And so God pointed at the life they knew, the agricultural life around them that they were immersed in. And, and God had made them by and large an agricultural people. He didn't lead them into New York and Philadelphia. He led them into what was mostly fields and olive yards and things like that. Yeah, there were a few big cities. But most of Israel stayed pretty close to the land. And if they brought a sacrifice, they still had to buy a lamb or an ox someplace. So there, there was more of an interchange there than there is now. And it did, in some ways, it here's a pet peeve. It made explaining things in the Bible to children so much easier. Because children growing up on a farm will recognize animals mating. It's a thing that happens. There's no huge surprise or shock. Oh, look, over there, they're mating. But we have so covered it over with a false sanctity and moralism that it becomes almost impossible sometimes to teach sections of scripture to young people, even teenagers, for fear that somebody's sensibilities are going to be shocked. Because some some basic things that every child growing up on a farm would know, they don't. They've grown up in cities, and if they haven't seen it on television. It isn't real. But God deliberately put things out there, you know, animals dying. That that cute mm -hmm. little that cute little lamb who's been with us for a few months. He's going to become a sacrifice to God. We will name him Sacrifice, so you don't get too attached. He has a destiny. It's to die. So you need to understand that. Then we're going that to here. eat him. Yes, and we're going to eat him. And he will become part of us. And like, oh, mom, wow, that's sick. No, yeah, yeah, learn to think that way when it's acted out around you all the time. I, and I suppose the last thing to say, although I, I've, I've hinted at it, is that these things are not ongoing into the New Covenant. There's no suggestion that we should be observing Passover as such or trumpets or any of these other things. We do celebrate New Year's Day, but January the 1st is absolutely meaningless economically, <laughs> yeah. culturally, or any other way. But, you know, so we go out and, and guess what? We make loud noises. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> we make New Year's resolutions. I think we're going to talk about this next time. We set things on fire. Yeah. Uh, human nature does not change. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, you know, some some things are basic. But the, the underlying principles here do coalesce into the Lord's Day. And, and we, sometimes we need to go back and look at the roots so we can more fully appreciate what the Lord's Day is all about and what Christian worship and liturgy is all about. We don't need to go back and do things the way they did. We don't need to have the incense. We certainly don't need to have burnt offerings. <laughs> but we do need to understand the principles that were at work and why, why God used such a thing. And we do need to understand that this is something that's, I think, unfortunate in Reformed history. Luther and Calvin, as far as I can see, were both of the opinion that the Lord's Day was not technically set or required in the New Testament. It was simply a day that the church chose. And that's, for one thing, that's sort of like handing Rome and then later Seventh-day Adventist all the ammunition they need. <laughs> oh, yeah, we in the church, we set the day of worship. Aren't we powerful? Later? See, it's a Roman Catholic conspiracy. No, but <laughs> Jesus set the day by rising from the dead and then meeting with his disciples. In the beginning, God set the seventh day by resting and gave no commandment. He just rested and assumed that his image would know that that's what you do. And it would be a long time, a couple thousand years before there would be a positive command. Because his example was enough for people who mm -hmm. loved him. 
And with Jesus rose from the dead, you learn real fast, especially if you're Thomas, if you don't show up on the Lord's day with God's people, <laughs> you're going to miss cool things like yes. Jesus. Um, and so very early on, they learned that that's, that's what you do in the book of Revelation, chapter one. It's the Lord's day. It's the only time in the New mm -hmm. Testament we find the expression. And, and, and what do we see? There's Jesus coming as if it's the day of the Lord. He's thundering like the glory cloud. He's dressed like a high priest. He's got a uh, message for the churches. He's got a message for the churches. He's holding their angels, their pastors, their messengers in his hand, and he speaks to his church. And then after all that's done, John is caught up into heaven and sees the same thing from the other side. From the throne of God, he looks and hears the church caught up into heaven, symbolized by 24 elders, all about the throne, singing holy, holy, holy with the angels and the cherubim and singing praises to the Lamb. And something that I missed for a long time, uh, we're, we're introduced to seven angels who are pastors in chapter one. Those seven angels keep on showing up. They're not new branch, new, new bunches of seven angels each time. It's the same pastors all the way through the book. So at the end, when John falls down before one of them, he says, stop that. I am one of your, your fellow servants. I'm also a prophet. In other words, I'm not an angelic spirit. I'm a real guy. I'm, I, I share your your prophetic ministry and that I too preach the word of God. Get up off your knees, which which helps us see the whole book of Revelation in that context. It's a worship service mm -hmm. and it pulls out so many elements. And again, this is something I think we talk about next week, uh, especially about Rosh Hashanah, New Year's Day, that it just to read Revelation as an outpouring or an analysis of the of the calendar will help you see things about Revelation, I think, that you, you might have missed before, at least things I've missed. Yeah. Well, absolutely, because Revelation is entirely dependent upon understanding the Old Testament. Yeah. When when I was young, and new converts were expected to read two books of the Bible. John, because it was the simplest and had no particular references to the rest of the Bible. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and the book of Revelation, because it was, you know, tomorrow's headlines. Yeah. Wrong on both counts. <laughs> ignorance of the Old Testament, but uh, you know, I, know I still kind of, I still kind of like John for a starter because oh. it's it is very straightforward in what it tells you. Not that the other Gospels aren't also straightforward, but no, no, I, it's not I, a bad starting. No, space. it's not a bad part. I, I don't mind that at all. I just, I just, I, I, I laugh at the the naivete of saying you don't have to understand the Old Testament. John, <laughs> John points and says the Lamb of God. I mean, honestly, we're talking to a convert who knows nothing. And today you have to assume that, that mm -hmm. converts really know zero, zilch. There was a time when every kid at least had gone to Sunday school or heard some biblical expressions or maybe had the Bible as literature in a university class, something, uh, or had seen, you know, Easter movies on TV late at night. Kate and I were working with a, a young couple several years ago now. They They were just on the verge of being Christians. In fact, they probably were at that point. We just didn't, or I didn't, I wasn't sensitive enough to get it and say, okay, you need to be baptized. But we said, well, what can we do for, um, in case says, my, well, my husband has this thing where he teaches the Old Testament 45 minutes. Would you like to hear that? Said, oh yeah, that sounds good. And so I used as my outline, the table of contents of the Old Testament. <laughs> but the funny thing is I got to Noah's flood. Like everybody knows Noah's flood. Mm, no, no. Oh, wait, the, woman, the the lady says, oh, wait, wait, wait. I think I just saw that. We, we we bought some children's books for our little girl. It was like, you know, two or something. Like, yeah, I think there was something about that in there. That's all she knew. Mm. Got to Samson, you know, long hair, Superman, you know, surely there were, there were movies back in the 50s about Samson. <laughs> Never heard of him at all. Mm. Nothing, complete biblical illiteracy. And so... When you come to John, it's a beautiful place to start, absolutely. But don't think that's going to get you off the, the bat of explaining who are who are priests. What tabernacled amongst us? Baptism, Pharisees, Sadducees. I feel like there's something behind this bread of heaven business. Yeah, there's there's so much going on here. Our fathers yeah. eat man in the wilderness. Manna, what's that? Ha! Huh? <laughs> I ironically get your desk at that way. Go. So. <laughs> Yes, so very apt, Brian. The mm -hmm. you understand the new, you got to know the old. Not to say that you can't read the new with without any profit, but if you understand it deeply, um, you are going to have to go back to kindergarten. 
all I know I learned in kindergarten. There's some some truth in that. <laughs> and that's why we're doing this podcast. That's, that is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, join us again next time for more studies in the Old Testament. <laughs> Do we have any closing recommendations for this week? I have one that's semi-relevant. It is a children's book called All of a Kind Family. It's about a Jewish family in New York. They have four or five daughters. And I read it as a kid. It's been years. Um, but what I remember about it is the liturgy from the weekly rhythm of their trips to the library to the Jewish calendar that they kept and the joy that was in that. And also the other side of, oh, you can't hold a grudge until the Day of Atonement. You don't have to give it up <laughs> until then. Oh. So it was. A, it's a nice enjoyable story about this little family with some added bonuses of insights into the mind shaped by the Jewish calendar. Well, now that you mentioned that, I got one. Um, my wife mentioned this just the other day. There is a book by a writer who goes by the pen name of Aliki, A-L-I-K-I. -I. Don't know anything about this person. But the, the book is titled A Medieval Feast. It's a children's book. It, I don't know if it even comes in hardback. Our copy was was a good solid paperback. It's very beautiful. It's, the illustrations are beautiful. The um, it, 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 It's simply the story of the king's coming for a visit to our castle, mm. to our lord and lady. What must we do to prepare for this? What elements go into making a feast? And so there's a discussion of the kitchen, well, actually, first of the hunting mm -hmm. and then of the the pastures and the crops and all that comes in. And then in the kitchen, what do they do with this? And then out in the dining hall, how do they adorn it and how do they set? It? And then how do they welcome the king as he comes? Uh, it's medieval, but it's very well done. A small child could easily follow this. Uh, and again, the artwork is, is colorful. It's not realistic, but it is, it's quite quite well done, quite beautiful. And I think for an introduction to medieval history and to the manners and customs and worldview of another time, I think it's a very valuable thing. And I think people, people at least who have small children or who like the Middle Ages will really enjoy the book. Cool. Um, for my recommendation, it's just a more practical uh, habit forming kind of thing. Uh, I have never really kept a journal I've always felt intimidated, and I also just don't like writing things about myself. <laughs> but one one thing that I've started doing, and it's even possible I mentioned this at least in passing before, but I I found this really great product. It's from the same company that makes uh, the brand of bullet journal that I use as well, uh, mm -hmm. like term, and they have one called Some Lines a Day, which is a five year memory book, and basically. Mm -hmm. There's 366 pages, one for each day, including leap days. And every day for a year, you fill out the top line across the entire book with just a few lines about your day that day. And then the next year, you move down to the next line, and there's blank numbers to fill in the year. Uh, so, so it's two and a zero, and then you can fill in you know, 21 like it is for me now. And it's just a cool starter journal for someone like me who doesn't feel the need to get super in depth <laughs> but it's a nice uh it's a nice way to start the habit if that's something you're trying to Brian, get Brian, let me ask you because i i have never journaled i tried it once when i was like in seventh grade and it got like through five days Same. what 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 do you see as the benefit of journaling the immediate practical idea is that there's a written record of your life Mm -hmm. And you could show it to your kids and be like, this is exactly what I was going through on this day. Mm -hmm. And also just the, the, the fact that writing things down, it codifies it in your memory mm -hmm. in a different way, in a more concrete way than just the act of having experienced it. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, we, we see this in different ways with, with other written down things. Like if you write down a task, you're going to remember hang on, 
I wrote that down. I'm supposed to be doing something today. Mm-hmm. It had to do with with the computer, and there was something with Microsoft Word. Oh, there's the list, and it says, you know, write an article on XYZ, mm-hmm. send Word file to John at the office or something. Um, so it's it's one way to just help keep your um, – your memory sharp, but also it's just a practical way to practice things like storytelling, um, sentence construction, mm-hmm. and there's a third thing I just forgot. I didn't remember it in time. <laughs> it actually came to mind first, and I thought of the other two things. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's just a it's a general all around practical habit to teach yourself your own stories and. Handwriting, that was the third thing. It's also mm-hmm. just more practice with handwriting is always good. And you you keep track of, of your own memories better. And it's a written record that you can look back on and either cringe at some of the things you've said and, and you go, <laughs> wow, I've grown a lot as a person. That's great to know. Yeah. Or even just go, oh, man, I remember that day. That was a good day. So it's it's just a a general all-around practicality that is uh worth at least trying to do more consistently you know i take it back i did journal one other time or on one (laughs) other occasion that was my first and second trips to europe maybe my third Mm. as well oh yeah first 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 one i was very thorough and i have made a thorough list of everything we ate (laughs) <laughs> and, and how to spell the important the, stuff. Yeah, and how to spell the names of the places we were visiting, especially when they were German. <laughs> and I couldn't. Ah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I I brought this along with me on my so far only Europe trip. Little things this travel diary. I got three days in before we were too busy to really even remember writing anything. <laughs> That's because you went with way too many people. When I went, it was just David Farshman and me, and. Um, you know, we were on jet lag, so we'd wake up really early in the morning and everyone else was asleep. So we'd do our Bible reading and our prayers and then we would journal. And, mm. you know, it was it was kind of built into the system by the time our clocks were reset, it was time to go home. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for this conversation. Look forward to continuing it with you next week. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in. Thank you to our financial supporters. Um, if you would like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Uh, you can send us an email with questions about why is it important to study the Old Testament, or you totally missed this aspect of that one feast. Send it to us. Halting towards Zion at gmail.com is our email address. And I think we might have a male jingle. We found out that... What about that... a female jingle? We yeah. need equal representation. <laughs> the sigh. <laughs> um, no, but we found out Hildegard von Glingen, um, the bardcore mastermind on YouTube, says it's totally fine to use her music as long as you credit the artist's. So we might have to steal that because Hildegard von Blingen is just so von Blingen. I have no idea what any of that means. We'll enlighten you in a moment. We'll explain afterwards. All right. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.